I, the other thing I wanted to uh, check out here, if I can just dig it up real quick, there was a forum thread that I wanted to cover. Uh, it was called Learning Theories and Their Subsequent Pedagogy, Which is the Most Libertarian? Uh, I do encourage people who are watching to go and check this out, but I really don't think it will translate very well to uh, the audio of the show, and I can link it in the um, the show notes for today. Where's the link? Is this it? Where's the clickable link? So it goes through uh, some of the uh, learning theories that we've talked about on the show before. And if you're unfamiliar with uh, learning, what learning theories are, this would be like behaviorism versus constructivism, which is really the the pair that we were taught about when I was a uh, grad student. Those were like the two uh, schools of thought in how um, learning and teaching should work. So from Wikipedia, real quick, a learning theory, uh, conceptual frameworks that describe how information is absorbed, processed, and retained during learning. Cognitive, emotional, and environmental influences, as well as prior experience, all play a part in understanding how, uh, excuse me, in, in how understanding or worldview is acquired or changed, and how knowledge and skills are retained. Uh, behaviorists look at learning, so then it goes into behaviorism, constructivism, uh, and this other one, cognitivism. So we've talked a lot on the show about behaviorism. Are you familiar? The Skinners sure. and the Pavlovs uh, and John Watson, who was the guy who uh, coined the term. Um, he believed that um, basically people needed to be conditioned, essentially. And uh, this was divided into classical conditioning, where behavior becomes a reflex response to a stimulus, like those dogs and the dinner bell, and uh, operant conditioning, uh, where there is reinforcement of the behavior by a reward or a punishment, which is today called school. But uh, yeah, I, I think we associate Pavlov more with uh, classical and Skinner more with... Um, operant. So this seems like to us very objectionable. And um, the remedy for this supposedly was called constructivism. Mm -hmm. And constructivism is really uh, tied to progressive, more um, student-centered. People, people might say Sudbury is a constructivist model. But the problem with constructivism, and it's really caught on. I mean, they're, they're really speaking this language in, uh, you know, the discussions about pedagogy all the way up to, like, the, the academic graduate level for, for several decades right now is that it is missing objectivism. So the objectivist model of obtaining knowledge is uh, discarded when it comes to uh, constructivism. They don't have any, uh, you know, it, it get, you get into this real well, could we really know anything <laughs> kind, of, kind of thinking. So that's the, been the craze in education for, for several decades right now. And uh, this was the dichotomy that they were giving to us in university back when I was a graduate student about 11 years ago. Now, uh, I had moved recently. And I had lots of boxes, of books and papers. And uh, when John posted this forum thread, and again, if you want to go and check this out for yourself, it is in the Libertarian Teachers group on SchoolSucksProject.com, and it is called Learning Theories Every Teacher Should Know. And it's really pretty much an infographic. It deals with learning theories, uh, internal and external, mm -hmm. the traditional theories of behaviorism, cognitivism, and constructivism, and uh, adding for the digital age, connectivism. Uh, yeah, I was interested to learn about that. Connectivism? Yeah. Um, I didn't really understand the infographic, but um, I, I was... I was um, uh, a word. Intrigued? Uh, intrigued by this uh, connectivism. Yeah, let's uh, let, let me just read the a definition for cognitivism first because it's kind of lumped with the other two that are more uh, traditional behaviorism and uh, constructivism. And uh, yeah, then let's talk a little bit about connectivism. Then I have a little treat for everyone. Not really I can't wait for treats. Yeah. Uh, so uh, 
cognitivism. Cognitive theories grew out of Gestalt psychology, developed in Germany in the early 1900s and brought to America in the 1920s. The German word Gestalt is roughly equivalent to the English configuration or pattern and emphasizes the whole human experience. Over the years, the Gestalt psychologists provided demonstrations and described principles to explain the way we organize our sensations into perceptions. Gestalt psychologists criticize behaviorists for being too dependent on overt behavior to explain learning. They propose looking at the patterns rather than isolated event. Gestalt views of learning have been incorporated into what some have uh, come to label cognitive theories. Two key assumptions underlined this cognitive approach, that the memory system is an active, organized processor of information, and that prior knowledge plays an important role in learning. Cognitive theories look beyond behavior to consider how human memory works to promote learning, and an understanding of short-term memory and long-term memory is important to educators influenced by cognitive theory. They view learning as an internal mental process, including insight, information processing, memory, and perception, where the educator focuses on building intelligence and cognitive development. The individual learner is more important than the environment. That sounds very un-German to me. You know, when you first... Well, I mean, when you hear it's about, it's, you know, an educational theory that came from Germany, I, I guess I just have this bias where that's not going to be good, you know, <laughs> considering... Especially if it came in the 20s. Like, yeah, I, I would, I need to learn more about cognitivism. They really, when I was in school, this was not something that was, was discussed. And um, a lot of the professors who, uh, I, I mean, I... Uh, well, I'll spoil it now. I went through some of these boxes and I found this folder of papers that I had written. Uh, here, where's the camera? Here are some papers that I wrote in an intro to education class in 2002. Mm. I was a dumb little young man. Uh, very confused. Mm. Uh, and the professor was encouraging that she was the kind of woman with like a long, she would wear like a long floral skirt and she would have Ooh. a a great deal of beaded jewelry. Nice. And, you know. Did she have an odor? Like patchouli? You tell me. No offense if you wear patchouli, anybody, but uh, she was very much, um, she, this was the class where we sang the Union songs. Oh. From the 30s. Joy. So that tells you a little bit about something, uh, about what was going on in that class and what the message was. She was also one of those people who wrote the textbook. So there, oh. I, I, I Notice that my papers have uh, numerous citations with her name <laughs> in them, which she probably really appreciated. And this is why a lot of people are attracted to this profession. And what did you get on this paper? I don't know. They or don't appear grade. to be graded. Oh, Let me see. The, the one that I wanted to read was uh, My Philosophy of Education by Brett Bonat, written oh. 11 years and two weeks ago to the day, March 7th, 2002. And it's just two short pages. I thought I would read it. And it's real. Excellent. It's a real shitty thing. I, I'm really kind of uh, embarrassed for myself here um, about what I thought 11 years ago. But should... it also has some interesting, it has some, some, a couple of promising sentences in it. Hmm. So um, I thought this might be a, a, a better jumping off point for our discussion than actually uh, going through this infographic. But I definitely recommend that people check it out. And um, after I go through this, which deals with the more traditional schools of thought in learning theories, we will uh, jump on connectivism sure. and explore that. Here's another thing, folks. We've remedied our uh, the, the phone problems that we've been suffering through for several weeks now. So if you want to give us a call and contribute to this conversation, 843-JOIN-SSP. You could Skype in at School Sucks Live. Uh, I always uh, just like to check in with the chat and see what they're saying. No one has said anything, unless mm. the chat has... Maybe they like the show and they're just listening. Maybe it's good when people don't chat because Maybe they're listening. They're so enthralled. Yeah. They're waiting to hear what your paper has to say. Mm, yeah. Maybe people chat a lot when they're like, uh, gosh, are these guys ever going to shut up so I can talk to you, streamer 829417? Are you going to read the paper in the voice of young Brett Vinat? 
would probably sound a lot like Larry the Liberal. <laughs> but uh, no, it's all right. So I'm a first year graduate student when I write this. Um, my philosophy of education. At this point, my philosophy includes elements of several others. Most of my current beliefs lean towards, guess what? Behaviorism. And Behaviorism. Yeah. That's it? Okay. Uh, although this is a change that has come quite recently. As a secondary history teacher, I feel that my philosophy should also incorporate some of the ideas of postmodernism and the theory of social reconstructive is reconstructionism. I don't remember what that is. Somebody, if it somebody, sounds bad. it does sound really <laughs> bad. <laughs> it sounds terrible. If somebody uh, wants to, here's what the chat is for. Uh, if somebody wants to look up social reconstructi uh, reconstructionism and throw a definition into the chat in all caps, I know that's kind of a tall order. I know that's kind of a really tall order, but if you could do that, it would be super helpful. Um, until I did my research for the debate on student-centered versus teacher-centered teaching, I was really in favor of a more progressive constructivist classroom. Now, constructivist, again, is just um, I, I, often tied to student-centered. I mean, that would probably be uh, the, the best shorthand for that. Uh, built on the work of Jean Pichet and Jerome Bruner, constructivism emphasizes the importance of the active involvement of learners in constructing knowledge for themselves. So constructing knowledge for themselves uh, was the, where this becomes problematic because obviously it implies that learners would have a lot of freedom like they do at Sudbury, but constructing their own knowledge and saying to some uh, you know authority figure, look at this knowledge that I made. <laughs> and they say, oh, that's very good knowledge. Good job, you made it all by yourself. <laughs> that's not how the, the world works. The is made of donut. <laughs> <laughs> That's not how the world works, folks, if you're new. <laughs> uh, it asks, uh, so let's see, and building new ideas and concepts based on current knowledge and past experience. It asks why students uh, do not learn deeply by listening to a teacher or uh, reading from a textbook. So there are parts of this that are really not bad. The problem was that when it was applied to the, the government school pedagogy, it just wound up being this cluster F where... Uh, people could do whatever, you know, Billy Madison painted the duck blue because he always wanted to see a blue duck and the teacher pats him on the head. That That's uh, constructivism. Uh, is there anything else that really is pertinent information here? No, I mean, so people get the idea. We've talked about this before. If you go to schoolsucksproject.com and search constructivism. That's a tangent. I can't yeah. believe we've never done a show on Billy Madison. We can. I mean, that's just ripe for uh, a School Sucks podcast. Do you want to do a double feature next week? Um, School sucks at the movies. We can do Billy Madison and one other. Okay. So I don't know what the other will be yet. Maybe people can suggest something in the chat if they have anything in mind. I would like to start talking more about movies. Oh, the the after show is pretty much just about yeah. movies. But uh, Rodney right. Dangerfield, Back to School. Mm, possibly. Yeah. Similar themes. Best times at Ridgemont High. Well, we could do Back to Paris School Bueller. and Billy Madison because <laughs> they have very similar themes. They, they are. Um, all right. So, so we're... Uh, well, let, let me start the second paragraph again. Until I did my research on the debate for student-centered versus teacher-centered, or in other words, constructivism versus behaviorism, I was really in favor of the more progressive constructivist classroom. Progressivism seems very idealistic and the warmest approach to educating children. The reason why I favored a student-centered model was it seemed to be the only way children could have a chance to completely enjoy their schooling. Also, because I am very impressionable early on in my study of education, I had decided that I should follow what seems to be popular belief. Now, how about that? That's a nice insight for a dumb little kid. Recognizing in college that I am impressionable. Hmm. I think a lot of these college kids, they come home and they're like, let me tell you now, about... Were you saying that though? Because that's what the teacher wanted you to say and she was impressing upon you that that's how you should think. Whoa, no. Oh, boy. All right. Um, however, when I reflected upon my own experience as a college student, I realized that my favorite teacher, Mr. Brida, had a philosophy rooted in direct instruction. Now, direct instruction ties to behaviorism because it's basically an adult at the front of the room controlling everything that goes on. So all the variables are basically controlled by them. Now, this is how college, all college classes work, pretty much, where a professor is at a podium and, you know, you want to do well, you basically agree with him. 
It's, 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 it's not how all college classes work, but it's a common theme at the university level uh, where professors are giving you textbooks that they wrote as if it is uh, an, an objective treatment of the subject you're learning about. I remember getting very frustrated whenever the professor would deviate from that particular way of doing things. Like, yeah, no, you discuss amongst yourselves. That would make me very uncomfortable. Why? Because I, like, hey, I am paying you to tell me what to think. You tell me what to think, I will write it down on a paper during a test, and I will get an A. Wow. Don't, don't make me have to, like, engage the material myself. That's Sh ridiculous. Sure. That's, okay. for, that's what we do outside of class. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. That, that makes sense. And I'll <laughs> tell you how I would actually uh, agree with that. There was this boy in a lot of my history classes, and his name was Walter. Now, I went to a small school. It was maybe like 1,500 kids. So most of the classes were small. They were less than 50 people. And you could know everyone's name. And uh, Walter was this really annoying boy who thought he knew a lot about history. And, he, and the professor, Mr. Brida. That's hilarious you call 50 a small class. I don't think I've ever been in a class that large. Well, no, I mean, I just think about, like, I go to UNH. I've, like, tutored kids mm -hmm. at UNH. They have these lecture halls that seat, like, 300 people. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. So, and whenever you see college in a movie. The idea that you're paying for that is really creepy to me. Like, why on earth wouldn't you be buying a YouTube video instead? Well, that's, like, yeah. If you're going to be talking to that many people at the same time. Right. Yeah, I, I Ridiculous. understand. Ridiculous. Right. Uh, but, but I would say a lot of my classes were between 20 and 35. Okay. And the biggest, the biggest any would, any would be pushed would be like to 50. This Brida, his classes were usually pretty full because he was one of the few history professors at the school. Uh -huh. So he taught most history classes. A couple of years, he might have taught them all. Um, so uh, Walter would always like to spoil. Brida would tell the story. You know, mm -hmm. he'd like want to tell, like really have it be this tale, you know, and it would be very dramatic. And he would talk about the Civil War and his depth of knowledge was so impressive on so many subjects. Um, and this is why he probably had such a big influence on me. But Walter would raise his hand and he would say, ooh, and then he died at uh, Wounded Knee. Mm -hmm. And, and Brida would just shoot him this look like he wished he would die for spoiling his story that he wanted to tell. So I didn't, I, that, I would be like kind of feeling the way you did, you know, where somebody would be ruining the narrative from the one person that I wanted to listen to. And Brida really, he, he, had, he was that sage on the stage. He had that command of the room. His pits would get very sweaty. But people respected him, and he was a, he was really hard, really challenging, and mm -hmm. and asked a lot of us. But but um, he, people really liked his classes. So, um, however, when I reflected upon my own experience as a college student, I realized that my favorite teacher, Mr. Brida, had been, had a philosophy rooted in direct instruction. Not only was his teaching extremely effective, but I also found the class very enjoyable, as I just explained to you and our audience in an anecdotal way. Uh, in the debate. I used a quote from Project Follow Through. I don't remember what that is. That quote, self esteem appears to derive from pride in becoming competent in the important academic skills. That's what they would like us to think, I guess. Uh, this student focused um, on disadvantaged, or sorry, this study focused on disadvantaged children K through three, uh, but it rang true for me. Until I started taking Mr. Brightest courses, I wasn't exactly a model student. However, once I started to experience success with very challenging subject matter, it seemed to spread throughout my learning. It's such a shame that this didn't happen in high school. Uh, go to the chat real second. Anything fun? Anything relevant? Uh, social reconstructionism is a philosophy that emphasizes the addressing of social questions and a quest to create a better society and worldwide democracy. Oh, that sounds like Barack Obama's speech today in Israel. He spoke in Israel? Yeah. Did he ride a donkey in? They say that's the sign of the apocalypse. Oh. And that he's the oh. Antichrist. He didn't ride I'm, a donkey I'm, in? I'm, no, I don't think so, but I'm glad you pulled that out of your uh, eschatological roots there. Yeah. Well, listen, if anybody hears about uh, Obama on a donkey in Israel... Text me or message me on Facebook so I can sell the rest of my Bitcoins and get some canned goods and uh, Bitcoin, excuse me. Yeah. Because that means the, the apocalypse is here. Obama's the Antichrist. He rides into Israel on a donkey. Yeah, he, he uh, there's a lot of talk of um, 
seeing the world how it is and also seeing how the world as it should be. As it should be. As it should be. So yeah, so that sounds like our social reconstructionism. Of course, all the uh, conservative commentators are seizing upon it and talking about how, well, this is the major themology of Saul Lewinsky, who is uh, evidently Barack Obama's uh, own personal Jesus that he's trying to uh, emulate. Hey, can we pause for a second and can I just hear you talk again? I'm talking again into the microphone talking about Barack Obama, our dear leader. I'm just giving you a little gain. Okay. Y- y- your levels were a little soft. You can All use right. a little gain. That takes care of that. All right, so uh, next paragraph. In Mr. Bride's class, we never got out of our desks and never worked in groups or did presentations. He talked and we took notes. I filled multiple notebooks for each class he taught. I still have them and I still read through them. Before I experienced any of these classes, they sounded dreadful. However, even though there was a lot required of us and a rather strict classroom atmosphere, Mr. Prida was so dynamic and intelligent that it became impossible to dread. It became the most exciting educational, uh, exciting and enriching educational experience in my life. Um, I should have added, until your class, Mrs. Shartok, you so this, liberal beaded jewelry wearing hippie textbook writer. Right. So this paper should have been called Love Letter to Dr. Brada. Brada? Yeah, Brada. I'm not, you know, no. I've never even <laughs> followed up with this guy and told him what an influence he was. He mm. might be horrified. <laughs> Dude, you should, you should title the next podcast, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, School Sucks Made Possible by Dr. Brida. I would, I, I, I should probably uh, <laughs> see what, he, last I knew he was teaching, I think he, I think he went and taught in community college, mm. actually. They offered him some kind of deal he couldn't refuse. That's where a lot of good teachers go, because they're allowed to do what they want to do. Yeah. You know, like any, anyone who's outside of the, you know, towing the party line of the mainstream. Yeah. They can go to that place as an outlet to do their more fringy, cool stuff. Yeah. Well, and that might've been him. He might've gotten some crap about some of the stuff he did. Um, you know, mm. cause I thought he was very revolutionary at the time. And, um, I wonder what him, it became of him, not just, uh, you know, as a professor, but also ideologically. Did he change at all? Um, I didn't get to include this inference in my closing argument in the debate, but it was this experience that helped me realize a new personal philosophy. I could identify with many of the ideas outlined in behaviorism. Some characteristics are the teacher should arrange conditions under which learning can occur. And that was a quote. And quote, students will learn best by the use of carefully planned schedules of reinforcement. Unquote. Uh, I also agree with the behaviorist call to embrace technology, to increase range as a teacher, and increase knowledge. That was kind of euphemism filled. Embrace technology. That's relatively uncontroversial. Mm-hmm. Increase range as a teacher and increase knowledge. That's pretty vacuous. Um, I would mark myself down for that. Mm-hmm. I don't believe that any teaching philosophy dictates the personality a teacher displays to his students there seems to be a misconception that instructivist teachers don't bring much personal warmth to the classroom. I believe that we should really strive to be dynamic and charismatic and to form solid relationships with our students. We should include personal stories and anecdotes when appropriate in an effort to show them our human side. However, in the high school and the class, the high school classroom needs structure. I think I was on my way. I think this shows, frankly, if I if I may, I think this shows a little bit of prompt that I could someday develop some okay ideas. Sure. Well, there's just the very notion that uh, you were in the process of changing your ideas. Yeah. Just showing that you can change ideas is the first step. It's half the battle, if you will. Of course, the as thing GI Joe would say. Yeah, yeah. Of course, the thing that's missing from this is um, real choice. I mean, we see that this is a conversation that exists very much in a box where what was presented to us as far as options with education uh, were behaviorism, constructivism. 
This, I think, was around the point where I discovered Gatto, just Googling keywords from this class on the internet. Now, Gatto has talked about everything and is very generous with his books as far as making them available online as PDFs or on his website. So it was around this time, 2002, 2003, that year, that academic year, that uh, I discovered Gatto. And I think I looked at it and said, well, that's interesting. School is kind of a conspiracy. Ooh. Ah, so that, yeah, wow. That jumped right out at you. Wild. But then I think, I think that, that idea got tabled for, for quite some time. I see. But it was around this time where uh, it was brought to my attention. Uh, okay. Did he, did he reel you in with tales of the Antichrist riding into Jerusalem on a donkey? Which one? John Taylor Gatto. No. Oh. No. Never mentions it at all. He, okay. he, gets, he goes to some, some dark and spooky places, though. Yes. Gatto. Like when he's tra he's looking at the history, I mean, he gets into Fabian socialism and um, he's thorough. He's definitely thorough. No antichrist talk. Uh, I also like the idea of postmodernism, that education should challenge the status quo. Shartok, page 64. That was my teacher. <laughs> Der her. Uh, especially as a history teacher. In high school, many students are unaware of the revisionist model of American history. I believe this is why many lack interest, because they take what we have as Americans for granted. And because more traditional American history implies that we deserve it. Manif uh, manifest destiny and all that. Um, social reconstructionism is also important. I feel that high school history students should be looking at current events and teachers should be leading discussions. Also, students should be encouraged to apply what they've learned about the past in an attempt to look for solutions in the problems of the present. So I'm hearing a lot of uh, I feel and I think in this paper. Is sure. this, like, this would be unheard of in my educational career. Like, you would never put the words I think anything. This was a different kind of paper. Like, obviously, okay. if you're writing a position paper, which I also do, folks, if you're interested in a... What does Steph say? If you subscribe, he, he <laughs> sends you his thesis. <laughs> hey, everybody. If you join the AV Club, I will send you uh, position paper number three, March 28th, 2002. Mm -hmm. Affirmative action. Oh, my. I'll autograph a copy <laughs> and send it right along. I'm sure it's a gem. Uh, it, I hope you don't mind that my photocopies will also have... Uh, uh, Eileen Shartok's notes on them. Shartok sounds like a Star Trek name. And they will smell like, a little bit like patchouli. Shartok. And, uh, when the walls fell. No? Tofu. What? Shartok? Shartok? I, I, it's Jewish. Like Star Trek. It's a Hebrew yeah, okay. name. Okay. Um, well, Gene Roddenberry, he was Jew. Jewish. So, oh, something that he would name. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. Last don't paragraph. Know. I feel. Whoa. <laughs> This is very now. Now, what I was saying in a position paper, obviously, a position paper you would never say, or any kind of persuasive essay, you would never say, I think, I feel, because it's already implied that if you're writing it, this is your opinion. Uh, but this was like a more personal and informal kind of writing exercise where it would be okay to say, I think, and I feel. Thanks. I feel that teachers who completely adhere to only one theory handicap themselves. I was upset when I was forced to take the negative stance for the debate, but it was a good thing that I did. Um, I see the necessity of exploring many philosophies and uh, embracing different elements in creating our own. By Brett Vinat. Well, it's a good thing you embrace more philosophies. Yeah, no shit. Huh? <laughs> My goodness. Where would we be today otherwise? No, but I really, I, I, well, I mean, did I really embrace more philosophies? Because I have a podcast where for like 170 episodes, I'm the only person who can talk. Nobody can talk back. I'm... Well, someone could call in on Skype. Well, no, but I mean, but for most of what the podcast was, it's not interested in, um, it, it's, it, it really didn't have a, even a, a channel for feedback. You know, like there was no way to like stop and respond to things I was saying. It wasn't a discussion. It's like, hey, you know, if you want to uh, hear me talk, you know, download this, put it on your iPod. I make videos today where I cut up sections of me talking. <laughs> And say, this will be so interesting that I'll put it into a video that people will watch on YouTube. 
You either have to have a <laughs> tremendous amount of pride in what you do, or something needs to be a little bit screwy with you to do stuff like that, I think. To Maybe. think that people want to hear what you have to say when they pretty much already know. I feel like pulling two minutes out of the things that you say in an entire week. Mm -hmm. it, I, I don't think there's too much hubris in thinking that that you have two minutes worth of something good <laughs> out of your entire week. I don't know. <laughs> like, I would like to think I had more than two minutes. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But, I mean, that is kind of this... But it's, it's interesting. It is kind of what I do on this show is pretty much like what I'm arguing in that paper. It's not hmm. totally dissimilar. Now... We do this little call-in show where I read things that people write in the chat. And uh, lately, I've kind of amended it to say... Um, I'm sorry, I just stopped to read the chat for a minute. You know, if you have something that you know about, call in and teach it to us. Because I don't know everything. I have lots of questions. I was doing this radio interview before this for some um, station in Oregon. Syndicated. She said it's syndicated all over the world. So I'm very excited about that. 20 stations. From, yeah, uh, and uh, I was saying, you know, I I forget sometimes the uh, the opportunity in saying that I don't know, and when you're a teacher or a media producer or somebody with a Facebook account, uh, there's a lot of pressure to know everything sometimes, and to um, you know, to be able to say this was something Bridie used to say. Bridie was one of the most knowledgeable people I ever dealt with on the subject of history regardless of maybe the political spin that he put on it sometimes. And he would say, with no problem, he would say, I don't know, I'll go home, I'll find out, I'll tell you tomorrow, or I'll tell you Wednesday, you know? <laughs> and, um, you know, I just think that when we decide that we know everything, like we talked about last week, we close off conversations. That, For sure. Um, and we meet somebody who has a difference of opinion, and we say, oh, well, you're one of those idiots. <laughs> And there's no opportunity to learn anything from that. I'm learning a lot from this Joe Rogan experience. People should listen to that. He's frustrating because sometimes you say he was talking about how heroic it is to jump on a grenade to save your fellow soldiers. And is it heroic? You no, know, I kind of sound like a D word, but you know, I don't think self sacrifice is, is heroic. And it seems like. Well, what is the definition of heroic? Well, I, that's. Uh, I think it's somewhat subjective, you know, and it's like, personal. Is it um, behavior that is worthy of being emulated? Is that heroic? I think so. Mm -hmm. But jumping on a grenade, but self-sacrifice, I, I think that th that's bad philosophy that we've gotten. But, um, so, we're in this room right now. Okay. Grenade in the middle of the table. Mm-hmm. It's going to blow us both up. Yeah. Is is that self sacrifice to jump on the grenade? I don't think it is. We're both. It would be self sacrifice if I were on the other side of that door and I opened the door and came in and jump on the grenade. Yeah. But given that we're both here, it seems like one of us might as well jump on the grenade. This is kind of the situation. Or should I grab your head and shove you down on the grenade? No. 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 You shouldn't do that. <laughs> this situation is getting a little lifeboaty, Osborne. Uh, I well, no, so. it's not though, because uh, I mean, this happens to not to us, but to people in war zones. Mm -hmm. You know, a grenade comes flying out of the sky and lands right in the middle of a group of people. Someone's got to make a decision to do something. I think it's. I think it's just when somebody is doing something, when they're taking a conscious action that is not designed to preserve their own life. I think something unnatural has been put into their head, right? Now, let's, let's, let's get real specific, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's say we're both injured, and you're two feet that way, and some, and, um, you know, or three feet that way, and, somebody roll, and I'm kind of lying on my side, and I can barely move, and a grenade comes and kind of like rolls up against my back, and I feel it while I'm on my side there. Well, at that point, I might as well just flop over on it and, and take one for the team. Sure. You know, if I can't move anyway, right? That makes sense. 
But the idea, I, I think we're talking about a, a broader idea of it being heroic to seek that self-sacrifice. Sure. You know, like there are people who want to go into war and jump onto grenades and they want, um, like what Thaddeus Russell was talking about. It's in kind of messed discussion. up. Yeah. 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 So, but, and that's why they need the propaganda machine. Or, uh, well, but there's also a bit of, uh, like a, a perceived, uh, hostage dilemma that's created mm -hmm. like with regard to the war machine. Right. Where if, if someone doesn't go do it, we're all going to die. Mm -hmm. So, you know, someone's got to step up to go do it. That That's the, that's the narrative that has been constructed for people to believe. Right. Yeah. And that's, so that, I, I don't know that that kind of self-sacrifice is as bad as a different kind. Well, I think that, yeah. And people really don't have a way to think their way out of that because they're not really given any, um, alternative information it's like yeah the the story has been reconstructed in such a way that we're all in the same room with a grenade exactly which is a, a, a total lifeboat situation right so uh you want to take a break we've been going for an hour oh sure all right <laughs> 